result of many constituents of Congressman Schiff, he requested that the General Accounting Office look into and try to locate documents pertaining to what happened here in July 1947 as it related to a crash of some type of object. Congressman Schiff did not stipulate that these people were to find uh, alien spacecraft or uh, some type of UFO not of this earth. He only stipulated find the records that would answer once and for all what truly crashed here. The General Accounting Office was to later inform Jack Anderson, in which he reflected this in one of his uh, articles in his column, that they too felt they were getting a runaround from they named the Air Force. But I would suggest that every agency that was asked that had any information was in fact giving the General Accounting Office a runaround. In order not to expose documentation that the Air Force did have, they stipulated that all records that would provide any solution or answer to what happened here in Roswell was in fact destroyed. It was uh, uh, later ascertained that the documents that were in question that were destroyed were in fact destroyed without proper authorization. Uh, Congressman Schiff then asked the General Accounting Office that they should try to ascertain who ordered those documents destroyed and at what time frame those documents were destroyed. General Accounting Office then came back to Schiff and stated that it would be very difficult to ascertain the time frame as it uh, reflected to them that it was 30, 40 years ago that those records was destroyed and at this late date it would be almost impossible to determine who ordered their destruction. However, at the same time, the United States Army was releasing records on UFOs. For the last half a century, the Army has been stating they did not have any records. It was found that the Army did have records, to wit, Army Counterintelligence Corps records that dealt with UFOs. They have thus far to date released 339 records. There is a record in there and it's very interesting. And it's this document, and it is this document right here. It stipulates, remembering that this is a document that was released dealing with UFOs. It is part of the uh, Counterintelligence Corps files pertaining to UFOs. You will note projects, U.S. Air Force Detachment 35. U.S. Air Force Detachment 35 was a highly, uh, a highly sensitive uh, intelligence unit at the time. This lists names of cities here in the U.S. that had some dealing with UFOs. You can find, as a matter of fact, some of these incidences referred to in the early histories of Project Sign, which was the forerunner of Project Blue Book. You will note, right up here, circled Roswell. This is a UFO file, or this is from the UFO files of the Counterintelligence Corps United States Army. You will note the authorization uh, for the declassification is based on an order signed into law by President Clinton, to wit, Executive Order 12958. You will further note that uh, originating agency interests Fully declassified? Yes. You will note down below that it states other agencies' interest declassified. You will note it's circled no. Clearly, this is an Army document. Clearly, this document reflects that these were projects that were turned over to the United States Air Force from Army files. Reason for that, prior to uh, September 1947, the, uh, the Army and the Air Force were the same. We find out that there was a concern about the existence of these documents or of these objects as to what their purpose was and what their origin was. This came home on February 26, 1942, commonly called the Battle of uh, Los Angeles. We find that there are some 15 to 20 unidentified craft flying over. Uh, Los Angeles. Uh, we immediately responded by trying to shoot these objects down. The 37th Coastal Artillery Group expanded 1,430 rounds without bringing anything down. We immediately set out to try to find out if there was some hidden base belonging to the Axis from where these planes could come, some commercial uh, airport that they could have had these aircraft housed. None of this bore out. Every uh, search effort we made turned out to be fruitless. At the same time, in the Pacific Theater, they were experiencing 
the same, uh, the same phenomena, the so-called Foo Fighters. MacArthur directed his intelligence people to find out what was going on. I have reason to believe that in 1943, MacArthur found out that, in fact, we had things not of this earth, that we had visitors from some other planet visiting our planet here that was actually observing that world event that we call the Second World War. One of the problems that he had was that should this be the case and should they prove to be hostile, we knew very little about them and we had very little means in which to defend ourselves. MacArthur organized what was called the uh, Interplanetary Phenomenal Research Unit. It would later be taken over by General Marshall and it continued all the way through to present day. Names have been changed. Records still haven't surfaced. The Army tries to state that it was not an official organization effort to try to investigate UFOs, but it was, it was organized by a general. It bore fruit. It came to conclusions it was not popular, i.e. interplanetary spacecraft. And they continued to do exactly what they do today, and that is to be part of a multi-intelligent operation in the recovery of objects of unknown origin, particularly those that are of non-earthly origin, and to assess that information, get raw field intelligence data, and process that data into some type of useful intelligence product to disseminate to the field to those people who have a need to know and those people that are the, shall we say, the keepers of that information. I believe that there was something that was discovered in China in 1943. Exactly what that something is, I have no idea what, what that was. But one of his Air Force generals, Army Air Corps generals at the time, came back to uh, MacArthur, told MacArthur what we have is something not of, the, not of this earth. I would further suggest that by this time, even the Germans had uncovered evidence that we were being visited and had some type of physical evidence. MacArthur definitely had physical evidence. From the documentation I saw, I was not able to ascertain exactly what that, do or what that physical evidence uh, consisted of, but it was there. The one thing I find quite unique is that the Germans may have tried to back engineer it. We definitely probably tried to back engineer it. But we find that your technology has to be on par with the acquired technology in order to back engineer. We very quickly were able to ascertain within three to four years after the end of the war that our visitors were anywhere from one to two billion years ahead of us. In the 1950s, the United States Air Force had an elite unit to investigate UFOs outside of Blue Book, even though Blue Book thought that that unit was working with them, that they were not. This unit was initially organized as the 4602nd Air Intelligence Service Squadron. Among its peacetime missions was uh, Operation Blue Fly. Operation Blue Fly was to recover uh, objects of unknown origin that fell to Earth. It's very important that you remember objects that fell to Earth because we didn't have any spacecraft up there at this time. As a result of this, these, they had monitors right there at Wright-Patterson that when UFO reports came in, they were looked at very closely to see if there was any possible means of, uh, or any possible necessity of sending out teams to recover any of this fallen debris. The Air Force states they never used them. I'm telling you they did, but the intent of uh, Project, our Operation Blue Fly, peacetime project, was to go out and recover objects of unknown origin that impacted with the Earth. Later it would be expanded in 1957 to cover all objects of unknown, or, or all objects of unknown origin, meaning spacecraft too. It, all, it would be expanded to a much larger program encompass, encompassing other programs out there and it would become part of what they would call in the 1957 October time frame, uh, Project Moondust. Project Moondust is the overall field exploitation to recover only two items. That is, objects of, of non-U.S. origin that survives re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere and impacts with the Earth. Naturally, 
we would be interested in those items from a, a uh, technical uh, scientific intelligence uh, basis to, de to determine or try to ascertain the technical capabilities of any potential enemy or known enemy of the U.S. at that time that was launching space vehicles into space. The other, ob or the other area of interest was objects of unknown origin. Now we find that there were quite a few objects of unknown origin that did not correlate with any known space la uh, launches or impact times of any known space debris falling back to Earth. We also find out that there was never a report filed uh, by our government that we had recovered these objects and then notified the country uh, we would immediately ascertain the point of origin that we had recovered them which would be required by international law and we never ever went ahead and had a political protest filed against us in short under moon dust under blue fly we have recovered alien debris not of this earth the degree of classification that we have now has changed over the years back during the uh, time of the second world war all the way up to say 1969 you may have had as many as 11 classifications. Now there are three, secret, our confidential secret, and top secret. However, if you have information that is highly sensitive, that requires the, the, the protection be above and beyond the norm of what is provided for those classifications, that's what you have the special access programs for. You do not get that type of information out into public domain unless it is officially sanctioned. During the discussion of UFOs, the question ultimately is going to come up, can any government keep secrets, let alone the U.S. government? And the answer to that is unequivocally yes. But one of the greatest weapons the intelligence community has at their disposal is a predisposition by the American people, the American politicians, and I hate to call them debunkers, but we'll call them debunkers, uh, people who wish to try to debunk UF, uh, UFO information, they immediately come out, oh, we can't keep secrets, we can't keep secrets. Well, the whole situation is, yes, we can. The National Reconnaissance Office remains secret uh, for many, many years. The, uh, the mere existence of the NSA remains secret. The, uh, development of the atomic weapon remained secret until once you exploded one you eventually had to tell some people what was going on why the Sun appeared to be setting down on planet Earth locations people's own perceptions of the universe the people's own thoughts as to the existence of life being out there is one of there might be life out there and we may sometime pick up radio communications but physics tells us they can't get here so we are conditioned by our own paradigms not to accept the possibility or probability of an advanced, highly advanced, intelligent civilization coming here to visit us. You have evidence in the form of uh, highly credible reports of objects being seen, of the entities inside these objects being seen. Yet we look for a prosaic explanation and we throw out the bits and pieces of the evidence that doesn't meet our, our paradigm. So it's a self-keeping secret. You can conceal in plain sight the existence of the abundance of evidence alluding to UFOs, even bringing that evidence out to the public. It's political suicide if you go and start hitting up intelligence agencies to get this information released. So most of your members of Congress, and I know I've worked with a lot of them along that line, will balk and try not to do it. I can name you uh, three scientists, or I'm sorry, three members of Congress that were point blank asked to have a congressional inquiry on uh, what happened here at Roswell. One of the most ridiculous statements that I got was that a person would have to be a chairperson to do that, and they asked a senator from Mississippi if he'd do it without any hesitation he said no 
And I said, well, excuse me, but is not the good senator we're referring to a chair member? And they said, oh, yes. And I said, would you give me that in writing? I got that in writing. But I'm hesitant to release it. I will show it to you, but I'm hesitant to release it simply because I made a promise not to. We have got to get the documentation as it exists in the government files. We have got to get it released before it ultimately comes up being destroyed. As soon as we open a door, and we're right there, we're about to bust open the door, good cases, the Blue Book file, or the Blue Fly and Moon Dust files. I had classified documents. The Air Force acknowledged when I got members of Congress to help me. They were immediately destroyed, and I can prove this. Somewhere along the line, they may see that material and realize there's some very highly sensitive information that would have damning effect upon the national security of the United States should it become compromised. It requires uh, to be further protected to ensure that there is only a limited access to that information to a small number of people. So small you can put them on a, a list of paper or on a piece of paper and list them by name. Thus you have the special access programs. The controls that were supposed to be put on the special access programs are not there. When Congress did their review of the way we do, uh, 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 the way we protect uh, documents and uh, the way we go ahead and implement our secrecy programs, they found that you had special access programs within special access programs, that it was essentially impossible to keep control of them all. And I'm telling you right now, it is essentially impossible to keep control of them all. When it comes to UFOs, the same criteria applies. The problem we have right now is that that event, i.e. In the ultimate contact, where there is no longer a question about the reality of other beings in the universe coming here, that event has not taken place. Therefore, but a small nucleus within the intelligence community, numbering less than 100, and I'd suggest less than 50, control all that information. It is not subject to congressional review by the, uh, the information security oversight at all. There would be quite a few missions to describe, but simply put, yes, I was involved in those type of operations. A lot of people think that you're just in a unit waiting in the rafters, just waiting for the next UFO crash or uh, landing where there's going to be debris. It doesn't work that way. You have a real life, you have a real job in the military. However, if you are in an area where an event takes place and you are one of these people that they can go ahead and call upon in your field of expertise, and I can't tell you what that field of expertise of mine would be because I really don't know. But if you're in that location, if you're in that vicinity, you'd be one of them utilized. Now, in order to prepare me for this, very early on in my career, they sent me to NBC school at Fort McCollin, Alabama. It's, it's a three-week school. It's a, for unit NBC personnel. NBC meaning nuclear, chem, uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical. And it would always be on the ostracism. That's what I was involved in. Later on, it would change to be something even more so. But you would go ahead. Uh, use it just as though it was a nuclear accident. There are procedures already established, a uh, nuclear or biological or chemical accident, a uh, hazard material accident, and you would utilize it that way. If you could get in there and do the recoveries, if you could go in and extract the debris that are there quietly, behind the scenes, and no one knows, you'd do it. If you needed an officially sanctioned deception program to uh, come into play, such as a bogus news release. You could do this also. You have an airplane accident. We have standard procedures on how we handle that. Those same procedures are utilized when you do a recovery or extraction of a crashed spacecraft or debris thereof. And I have to stress debris simply because these are highly advanced technical machines. There were not that many crashes. They're flawable because they are made by an intelligence that is as mortal as you and I. Us being mortal, 
we are subject to error. Now we're talking about a highly intelligence, a highly intelligent civilization, not a highly incompetent civilization. We take steps, they take steps, but at the same time when you go out you make a recovery and when you make that recovery you handle it the same way you would as if you were out there hitting up on a uh, airplane accident or you have a uh, ha uh, hazardous material type situation because it works it's all set up the only problem you have is that you have people out there that are very quickly going to realize that this is not something of this planet. To be sure, with the blue fly, blue fly aspect of recoveries, you do what's called an on-site analysis. In short, you have experts out there who know what missiles are, who know what aircraft are. They're looking at this material. They're telling you what it isn't. This leaves you to only one possible conclusion. Something that did not originate on the face of this planet. That was the intent of the Blue Fly teams. It was very critical to do an immediate on-site analysis. Now the way you package the material, if it's just debris, it is handled the same way you would if it was uh, hazardous material. You took precautions if you had a whole craft, you took very serious precautions because while I still state they are not hostile, but you could cause some serious accidents which would result in death. Um, not going to get into it how it was with the family when I had to leave because you get a little emotional because you think about what could happen. But the whole situation is we didn't reinvent the wheel. I can show you the documentations, how we, uh, documents on how we would do this except for the classified aspects of it. But they are as valid today as they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago. We have just made improvements. Of course you try to conceal the material, particularly if you have a large craft and it's disc shaped or say wedge shaped, which is a very good shape that we get from time to time. Uh, and you do this particularly if you, if you have to go ahead and put it on a truck to bring here. If you have to bring, put it on a truck to take it to a safe haven area, we track that truck. The truck has an 800 number currently today where if there is a breakdown, they're to secure the vehicle and stay with it. But they have a number they can call and immediately get assistance out there to move that vehicle to a safe haven area. And there are procedures outlined in this. As a matter of fact, you have a shipping document. And that sh uh, shipping document has the number right on it where you call. What you have, you have a code word. There's a code word, uh, I'll use one that we used all the time, Tabasco. Let's say your code word is Tabasco. Well, they're not going to send people out there uh, that are familiar with aircraft, that are familiar with specific types of chemical, or people who are real experts in uh, nuclear waste or things of this sort. You're going to get a specialized team out there that knows what to do should there be a biological, and one of the big concerns we had was biological, they do too, uh, contamination as a result of this being truly of alien origin. I am prepared to state that I have been at locations where craft of, un, of unknown origin that did not originate on the face of this planet was there. I am prepared to state that while I was there, we saw living, dead bodies of entities that were not born on this planet. I am prepared to state that we had what, we, what they referred to as interfacing with those entities. I am prepared to state that the situation is they have a school to try to indoctrinate people. I never went to that school. I always refused. I am prepared to state that when I got out of the service in 1990, uh, 1990 that they held me for two months that I might better reconsider to stay in and not get out. I am prepared to state that I had orders that stated that I was supposed to get out November 1st, or November 1st, December 1st, I think it was, December 1st of uh, 
1989, that they revoked those orders, once again in violation of law, to hold me for two months pending approval of my retirement, which had already been approved. The purpose of that was to try to convince me to stay in. We have contact with aliens not originating from some foreign country, but from some other solar system. And I have been a party to that. I've worked it. I've been there. And I know some of the things we do is really, 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 really terrible. They are not hostile toward us. We're the enemy in this instance, but we're the enemy, I like to think, for the good reasons. We're concerned about what some other country might do. I have concluded that I'm fighting against the clock, that I have but a short time to try to convince people that we are moving in an avenue where we are going to militarize space. Once we militarize space, we will have a whole new avenue of technology open up to us. While NASA says it's going to take another 1,400 years before we uh, achieve what we call interstellar travel, I'm telling you by the end of this century we will be doing that. We want to acquire this technology. We want to make this technology part of our own technology. Within the next 25 years we're going to militarize space. As a result of militarizing space, we are going to acquire new technology. We're going to evolve new technology that's going to lead us into interstellar travel. As a direct result, we will become a threat to them unless we spiritually grow also. But I feel that if we do not, if we do not go ahead and spiritually grow, we are forcing the situation where the entities will eventually make themselves known and they will make themselves known and no power on earth can stop that from happening in order to avoid us from going out into space. That if this should happen, it will happen to an unsuspecting world population and that can create some very serious uh, problems. But this doesn't deal just with the United States. It's a truth that the entire world has to be informed about, and that truth is man is not alone. That we have people from other planets, from other solar systems coming here. I believe that the intelligence community had good intentions when they classified information dealing with uh, UFOs. I believe that they asked some very serious and hard questions. What impact would it have if the peoples of the world knew that they were no longer alone in the universe, that they had intelligence that was visiting this planet. And I think that the intentions were good there. As intelligence agencies among nations, naturally you want to go ahead and acquire the technology for military application, so you want to try to keep some of that aspect as confidential as possible by classifying it as high as you possibly can keeping it to uh, keeping the information open to but a small handful of people, thus special access programs. However, I believe that while it was full of good intentions in keeping this information classified, it is hurting people. I do not believe that any government has the right to uh, try to make individuals who merely see UFOs look crazy when we know the truth. I do not believe that any government has a right knowing that the, psych, uh, the psychology of specific individuals may ultimately lead to them having their homes broke up, their jobs uh, lost, leading to a tremendous amount of mental depression, ultimately leading in many, many cases to suicide or self-destruction. When we see these types of things coming about, we have an obligation to reconsider our thoughts and standpoint. Reconsidering those, I would suggest we need to break down the walls of secrecy. That we must be responsible in getting the truth out. We must be responsible in how we get that truth out. And we must be truthful. And it's not a scary story. You will learn that there they have a perception of God. They can't tell you what religion's right. You find they have families. You find they have cultures. 
you find that they have likes and dislikes. You find that you look for those things that are similar among us, not the difference. And that's the way you start on the path to truth. The problem that we have right now is that we look at them as something to talk about, something to be marvel at and be amazed at, but here again, they are still considered with in the recesses of our mind of something that's not practical and something that isn't real. Well, we just finished with uh, the training that I took uh, to be an NBC NCO. And a friend of mine, which I'll call him Jack, and Jack was his first name. He was a Spec 5. Uh, he brought me back to Fort Lee, Virginia. Uh, somehow, some way, my ticket, my billfold, everything came up missing. I got my billfold with the money back in it, but I never did get the ticket back. But not having a way to get back to Fort Lee, Virginia, he was going to Fort Meade, Maryland. He says, come on, I'll take you. And we discussed UFOs on the way to Fort Lee. Several weeks after I got back to Fort Lee, I got a call from Jack, or allegedly it being Jack, and I believe it to be Jack because he was a cheerful, happy-go-lucky person, and this person sounded the same way. However, when I got to Fort Meade where he was supposed to be at, they said, well, he's going to be tied up. We'll talk to you later about his situation as soon as he gets free. He says, by the way, have you ever been to uh, the Pentagon? Well, at that time, I'd never been to the Pentagon. So they said, well, it's really a unique place. Says, why don't we go ahead and give you the 25 cent tour? So we went on over. We went in. I had a little badge that was given to me, no picture on it. But the guy that was with me, he has had a picture, and he'd just tell the guards, he's authorized to come with me, and he'd always be the one to get me in. Uh, you had to show your military ID card from time to time, but we walked down the corridors. Finally, we got to a place that had an elevator. We went down. I don't know how far down we went. Uh, I can't tell you if there's one, uh, one flight under the Pentagon, two or 50. But we went down. When we went down to, I don't know, several seconds in, in the elevator, we get out. When we get out, there's just like the white walls, and it's like an inverted D, like a flat bottom with a curved top. Now, there's two monorails there. I mean, they're rails. They look like big tubes, rather th thick in the center, and two on the side, on e one on each side. I could probably draw you a better picture of it when I'm describing it. But you had these little uh, monorails, what I, what I call them, uh, cars that look like a bullet. I mean, for lack of a better term, you, could, you had uh, where you could see two people in front, two people in back. We got on the one monorail and started to go, and it seemed like maybe 20 minutes, but I'm guessing at that because I don't know for sure. When we got out, he says, well, let me show you some interesting sights down this corridor here. So we're going down the corridor, and it looked like there was a door at the far end of that corridor. As we got closer and closer to that door, my guide turned to me and stated, you know, things aren't always as they seem to be. He says, like, a lot of people don't know about these underground locations underneath the Pentagon. Few know that the Pentagon has underground monorails that connect up to other locations. And he says, it's just like, you know, the walls here. They don't all seem like walls. And I said, what, what do you mean? They don't, uh, they're not walls? I said, what are you talking about? I, th I thought you were always trying to make a joke. Uh, at that time, he says, no. He says, like the wall behind you. I look, it looks like a wall to me. There's no seams, nothing I can see. Then he pushes me. I try to grab myself. And you don't just go through it. The do there's actually a door there that open. You want me to finish this too, don't you? Well, when you go through the door, there's like a field table there. And behind the field table, you had this little entity. The entity was a little bigger than the three, three and a half foot uh, tall entities that are a lot of times reported. But there were two men on either side of the table, slightly behind the creature. But yet I got up and I was asking him why he was acting foolish and things of this sort. I uh, won't go in how we were hitting up on that. But when I turned around, I uh, looked right into the eyes of this little creature. 
And, uh, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you're seeing it, but everything's being pulled from your mind, pains you felt, you feel that, and it's like a buzzsaw going off on your head. Uh, he was reading my whole life. And I mean, you know, it's hard to describe what what you really felt there. I, your life up to that point in seconds. And I mean, you were feeling everything. Uh, went ahead. I remember going down and grabbing a hold of my head like this and falling to the floor. Next thing I remember, I wake up and I'm back in Jack's office. And uh, when I'm in, back in Jack's office, they told me nothing happened, that I'd been there the whole day, but I knew better. There is an interaction between entities and certain uh, government agencies within the U.S. government. I will not go so far to uh, state that they are giving us technologies to kill ourselves. Uh, they are not along that line. Their purposes of being here are for scientific purposes and for humanitarian purposes. Abductions, those abductions which I believe to be real, have nothing to do with the uh, scary scenario abductions that people hit up with. There's a reason for it. We have been very foolish in how we have done certain things, and we have harmed ourselves. We now realize that we have harmed ourselves, and we are trying to take corrective action. And that right there is the one thing that they're checking on. There's been the vile sphere that's been damaged. They're not coming here to repair that. They are coming here to see how we handle it. But a government can't be the one that shoulders all the responsibility and show, shoulders all the knowledge and all the understanding. The whole situation is, is that we have to work in unison as a people, a united people. Let's go ahead and start preparing ourselves to where we ultimately will take that giant step to where we're going to be visiting other planets out there in other solar systems. And we have to, once again, I'll use the word, grow spiritually as a group of people. The people representing mankind on planet Earth. Yes, there is some type, and I don't know to what extent, but there is uh, some type of dialogue that is taking place between our visitors of all species, because there's more than one, and the various governments of not just the U.S. government, but of the world's. Primarily, the fully developed are the, how do I put this, the more developed nations of the world. Because at present, spacefaring nations represent the greatest threat to them as a peaceable coexistence. So I went ahead, took the little snack lunch that I had with me, took it upstairs. Uh, we were looking down, we were seeing the briefing room, it had like a plexiglass that separated the balcony and uh, what was going on downstairs, and you couldn't hear what was being said. But we started to notice that they were running the film, and the film showed uh, various types of what we would call UFOs today, and showed various types of uh, alien creatures, i.e. Uh, your greys, uh, some covered with a whole lot of hair, some that looked very much like us, uh, some that looked like us with marked differences. We were not aware of the fact that there were people now up there with us. And they told us, you know, do you guys, what are you guys doing up here? And we told them, well, you know, we're just sitting up here uh, eating all our snacks because we didn't want to go to the dining, or we did not want to go to the uh, snack bar. And they went ahead said, you need to come with us, and you need to come with us now. So, I mean, they pushed us, grabbing us by the nap of the neck of the shirt, and pushed us down the stairs. Once they got down to the stairs, they pushed us on out the doors, pushed both of us into a van. The van was right there waiting. 
uh, panel van where they pushed us in and shut the door. And then they drove us off. We don't know where they took us to, but the location where we finally got out was a one frame uh, military style building. They took us in there, put us into this room. The room had uh, like the military cots there, had one table with a light there. And we were sitting back trying to figure out, well, why are they doing this? Why, why is this going on? So on the fifth night, I got out. Uh, when I left the fifth night, they drove me back to my billets. I went in, reported in, went to bed because I was dead tired. All I want to do is get some sleep. Next morning, which was a Saturday morning, I am awakened by the CQ. That's charge of quarters. And he says, first sergeant wants to see you. One guy was acting like a good guy. The other guy went ahead and says, I told you, we shouldn't trust him. Let's just take the so-and-so out. Let's just end this. Let's shoot him. And one guy, no, 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 we'll discuss this. And he sent the guy that was supposed to be the bad guy. We use that sometimes in security, good cop, bad cop. But the one that's supposed to be the bad guy, he went to get some food. Uh, we had coffee, the guy that stayed there that was acting like the good guy, and myself. And he says, listen, he says, you like working with this stuff, and I don't know I don't. And he says, well, you know, you have experience in it. You've had some involvement. He says, and those were not phony pictures up there. They were not trailers. He says, would you like to work with it? Would you like to work with us? No, I wouldn't like that at all. Eventually, he goes ahead and says, look, you like working with it. You'll get to work with it. You'll get to learn more about it. He says, but the whole situation is by the end of this year, we're going to release everything we know. But here again, the world is not a safe place. We have to know more from a technological viewpoint, a military standpoint, than potential enemies of this country. So I'm asking you, work with us. Well, I thought about it. You know, I was young, and I thought this is something that I've actually been involved with all my life, that it'd be fun, that I could go ahead, uh, learn certain things, answers to the questions I had, actually get a better understanding of events in my life. I do believe that one, they want me in the military. Two, they want me involved in this program. Three, they wasn't really concerned about if at some later date I started to talk about it. They were only concerned what I might have to prove. If I had some little slivers of proof, what impact would that have on my story? And that's the speculation I have on it. Um, I know they did not want me out. I know they want me to stay in. I know they want me to go ahead and go to what they referred to as the school. But I never ever uh, would permit myself to go to what they were referring to as the school. If you go to school, it will open up a whole new world for you, a whole new avenue. But I had to agree to it, and I had to go ahead and sign specific papers to go to it, and I was not prepared to go to that school. I'd seen people who were involved uh, with the program that had gone to that school, and let me just say I didn't like their personality. Uh, I did not like the idea that by you going there, it made you something special. It made you uh, prima donna, if you wish. Uh, that was not the way it was supposed to be. I felt that one of the greatest things you can be is a servant and not vice versa. So some of these people, I did not like their disposition, I did not like their attitudes, and I did not want to become like them. And one of my fears was if I went to the school, if that would change me the same way. So it's important that people understand that. Now there are events, there are recoveries, but the recoveries are few and far between. One of the events that took place in 1969 was a recovery of a craft that I, I call it a wedge-shaped craft, that took place in Indian Town Gap. Now I know it was cold, therefore I believe it to have been in the winter, there was no snow. We were on a field training exercise. The 96 Civil Affairs Group, I was part of the 96 Civil Affairs Company, I was the NBC, uh, NBC comma, uh, which is communications. NBC being nuclear biological chemical, 
uh, unit in, uh, in COIC, which is non-commissioned officer in charge. Uh, we were notified that they had an incident involving a downed craft that we needed to assist in recovering. The persons that showed up knew exactly where we were going because when we went to our staging area, pulling out of the, co uh, the company exercise, or should I say the, the group exercise, we went to what we call a staging area. From there, we went to another location on, uh, on Indian Town Gap. We didn't have any problems about civilians or curiosity seekers or anything like this. Uh, other than to go into a whole lot of detail about that particular craft, uh, there is a tape out there that does go into detail on it. Uh, the situation is we did the recovery. Uh, as far as being fully involved in the recovery outside of going up and getting surface readings, realizing that what I was seeing was not of human origin, uh, I was limited in my involvement. When we got there, there was already teams set up, floodlights were already set up around the object. I was asked to get closer and closer to the object to take readings with the APD-27. As I did this, I realized what I was seeing was not of a earthly origin. Uh, I'm hesitant to go into it too much because I don't want to get emotional about it. Bentwaters is another very interesting case. Uh, with Bentwaters, we went there to digest some of the information as far as the physical evidence there. There were photographs. There, were, there was film footage. There was evidence of high background radiation, or a higher than normal background radiation. Not all that high, but above normal. We found that there was some abnormalities in the area of which we uh, referred to the impa impact point. We also noticed that the trees had uh, been leveled off at the top. Uh, when we got there, it was December, I want to say December 28th was the day that we arrived there. Uh, we gathered up the materials. We took these materials back to Lindsay Air Force Base. All the, uh, for lack of a better term, all the hard evidence that we could get, all the, all the documentation that was there. <clears throat> there was even some photographs, which I don't think has been alluded to, as far as sightings that was picked up on radar. Both the British government and the U.S. government were aware of these sightings. The uh, hard evidence that we had was taken back to Lindsay Air Force Base. There it was digested to where there was some type of uh, information that could be put out to uh, brief SHAPE headquarters. And I don't know who in SHAPE headquarters was briefed, but I, did, I do know that we did have to do that. The information was uh, then put with a special carrier and we were told as being sent back to Washington, meaning Washington, D.C. I don't believe this to be the case. I believe it was coming back to an air base close to the Washington, D.C. area, and that the material was transferred on to uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia headquarters at, at the time of the U.S. Air Force's uh, Special Field Activities Group, uh, or uh, Air Force's uh, uh, Field Activities Center. They then took this material, did whatever they did with it, and came up with finalized intelligence product. The important thing to remember, the reason it went to Lindsay was because the uh, U.S. Air Force's uh, Field Activity Center had detachments in the field. The closest detachment in the field at the location of Bentwaters would have been Lindsay Air Force Base, which is DET-24. They were the ones that got the material. They were the ones that was charged with safeguarding it until it got back to the U.S. Also, there were several members of DET-24 that was involved in the investigation. There were other people who came in who we didn't, I didn't know who they were, but you knew they were involved in the investigation because they were doing the things that would be necessary to do just that. They were asking questions, hard questions, critical questions. They were asking technical questions of technical people that was involved. I'm, uh, I know for a fact that some of the radar operators, both British and U.S., were questioned. I know some of the people that were out there on two different nights were questioned. My involvement became in June, July of 1989. I was involved with the, the Belgium sightings that we were assessing information, gathering data on the UFO overflights of Belgium. They also went over, Europe, uh, over Germany. We had one incident there on the border, which 
This one occurred near the photo gap. The incident there at the border, we saw the object. It was over Soviet territory. We saw that the Soviets were pretty upset. We were getting pretty upset because this was a huge, a huge object. You would, it was triangular shape, about three football fields on either side of the triangle. It flew over what we call no man's zone. Uh, as it flew over there, we all were getting jittery. Uh, it wasn't uh, winter. It was, uh, I'd say, uh, summer, about August. Uh, you could feel your hair standing up on the end. Uh, it was more than just, you know, getting shivers because of fright or something like this. There was some type of physiological effect taking place. Once this incident uh, subsided, we put uh, fighters on alert. We notified them that we may have a Soviet craft coming across the gap and we were going to intercept it. The Soviets did the same thing. It went back over the Soviet uh, airspace and they scrambled fighters to try to intercept it. It wasn't traveling fast at all, uh, traveling very slow, no, no hurry to get out of the area. But on this particular night, no one fired at it. There were pictures taken. There was consultation with the Soviet Union. With this going on, uh, everyone was taken in and brie uh, briefed and was informed that what they saw was nothing more than a Cuban MiG, or I'm sorry, a Russian MiG-27 that had strayed across into the photo gap area far uh, enough into the no man's zone to create a problem and cause some alarm. It was no MiG-27. We know exactly what we were looking at. Uh, we knew what MiG-27 uh, MiG-27 looks like. You have flashcards, which are silhouettes of the various craft of the Soviet Union and even our own. <coughs> so we knew precisely what we were looking at. What we saw was a craft that was of an unusual origin. It was not aerodynamically sound. And when I state it was not aerodynamically sound, I mean it had no means of staying aloft like that uh, without some visible means of aerial support, like, like a helicopter. That wasn't there. It was perfectly silent, not making any noise, roughly three stories high. Uh, this was one of the incidents that got me a little concerned, made me think about wanting to get out and come back to the family, to have a, uh, some family life. Uh, we had the incident escalate. We had it escalate to where the Soviet Union filed an official protest through the Belgium government to the U.S. government stating that uh, they were very uh, concerned about the Belgium authorities along with several other uh, countries letting us fly stealth aircraft on reconnaissance missions into the Soviet Union. We notified and discussed it with, uh, with the Soviet Union. We briefed at least two smell uh, Soviet military liaison mission groups that uh, this had nothing to do with our involvement of sending stealth aircraft into their territory. The Soviet Union was alarmed about what was going on. They even alluded to it being our craft. They were reassured that it wasn't. We reassured the Belgium authorities that it wasn't. The Belgium authorities had their own UFO sightings. We have seen this on TV. What you don't know about those sightings is that, that there was a tremendous, um, I don't want to call it a cover-up. There, there was a movement to keep specific information about those sightings under wraps. There was some uh, intentions to go ahead and alter the film footage of the uh, radar screens to, it, to the point of where it showed that the UFO went underground, which it did not. I think it was supposed to have gone 600 feet into the earth. That did not happen. It was, it was visible. People saw it. The pilots saw it. The pilots' uh, uh, aircraft locked onto it. But these were things that would create more questions then, there, well, then we were willing to answer. So we decided to keep this out of the press. And we were successful at it. Uh, the Iranian incident of September 19th, 1976. 
the situation with that, there are highly classified documents dealing with what we found. Both fighters were taken apart to try to find out if there were any changes, if there was any way we could explain what really happened to those fighters with having the, having the malfunctions at the same time. There was a situation where we had uh, some anomalies picked up out where the siding was, where, they, where the F, one of the F-4s saw the uh, UFO go down to the ground. We recorded those anomalies with audio devices. We took film footage of the area, and there were some strange things that showed up on that, on that film footage. What all took place there at the landing area, I am not privy of. I don't have all the information. It wasn't something I had to be involved in. But I can tell you this much. Whatever took place there had people out there for two to three weeks. In 1986, I believe it was, fired at a UFO on two occasions. The UFO took off like nothing happened. In 1980, 1980 I believe it was, you had the incident where you had, uh, no, this was in 86. In 86, you had the incident where you had uh, 20 or more UFOs flying around Brazilian aircraft, flying rings around them. These documents are important. They're, they're documented events by government document documentation. How many there have been overall since 47? Not, not more than two dozen. Uh, that's domestic or international? Well, that, that right there was uh, a round figure, but it's based on a briefing we got. And this briefing came as a part, this was in 1969, when we were hitting up on information dealing with the recovery of the B-52 there. We were informed that there had only been a couple of dozen tops, that there were several in the 40s and the early 50s. And once again, to make it perfectly clear about those events that took place there, there, and I mean, it sounds crazy, but their, their, their guidance system our radar wrapped ha havoc on, and they had to make adjustments to their guidance systems for that. How many bodies had been recovered? Don't know. Uh, how many crashes have occurred in which we only got debris from because they came and did their recovery before we got there? Don't know, but it, it has happened. It has happened. When they have problems, just like we send out a distress call, they send out a distress call, which is something that a lot of people don't allude to or don't even, it's the one question that's never asked. But here again, we think of them as something intangible, like that stuffed animal there. But they're living, breathing creatures, as mortal as you and I. They think, they have loves, they have likes, they have dislikes. They have social culture. This is so, so important to try to make people understand that that is the case. I want to put the human factor back into UFOs. And when I say the human factor, that these are real people. You can call them entities, you can call them creatures. The uh, only reason I do that without saying these are real people is so it doesn't get confusing as to what I'm talking about our visitors are us. But you sometimes find yourself wondering, who's the more real people, them or us? And the situation is, uh, these are the things that, that really need to be brought out also. The fact that they are, in fact, uh, just like you and me. We need to seek out the similarities, not the differences, and come to a greater understanding because eventually, in the not-too-distant future, we're going to have that final contact that's going to open new doors. A lot of people sit back and say, well, they don't have bases here. Uh, yeah, they do. Do you have specific information about their bases here? We were involved in a major engagement in 1970 
in one of their bases at a place called Dewey Badian. And uh, where is that? In Vietnam, Tainan province, approximately seven miles from the Cambodian border. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I did an audio tape on that, and I'll make you a copy of the audio, audio, the audio tape. Uh, I'm, I will apologize for actually trying to hold back from some of the stories, simply because if I start talking about some of the stories, you start reliving them, and you don't understand. I mean, you really don't understand. And the same thing with the actual craft. No seatbelts. You don't need seatbelts. Because when you fly one of these things upside down, there's no upside down like in a regular aircraft. You have your own gravitational field right inside. So if you're flying upside down, to you, you're right side up.